All right, we're back. Um, this is now Senate Health and Welfare. We've completed our meeting with Senate Judiciary, and we're moving on to a concern that we all, we each have, and that is around the mental health of kids, particularly after, during and after and around the pandemic. And we understand there, that some of the issues around mental health have escalated uh, for children during this time. So we're going to hear from um, Commissioner Squirrel first, and then we'll move through uh, some really important witnesses. So thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank Mr. you, Squirrel. Yes, thank you, Senator Lyons. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all. I hope you're doing well, despite that snow outside, which we'll all just pretend isn't there. Um, except for those of us that might enjoy some spring skiing or snowboarding. Um, I do want to just take a moment and introduce other members of the DMH team who are joining us today. Uh, Laurel Omland, who was our director of our Child, Youth and Family Unit, um, and then Dr. David Ratu, who is our medical director for the Department of Mental Health. Morning. Morning. And I I think, uh, Nellie, if it works for you, uh, Laurel is planning to share her screen. We do have a presentation for the committee this morning. Um, so Laurel, if you wanna tee that up, then we will get started. Uh, and just for the chair to be aware, I do have to hop off at about 10.55 to join the governor's press conference. Um, so just so the committee is aware. That's fine, thank you. Of course. Okay, um, well, certainly as the chair um, so eloquently noted, uh, our focus on child, youth and family mental health is absolutely critical from the department's perspective. Uh, the social, emotional and mental health needs of children and youth are critical. Um, we are all aware that children or youth are setting long-term health trajectories in their earliest years. And we have an opportunity to focus our mental health services and supports um, upstream. Uh, we all recognize that the earlier we can intervene, the better the outcomes. And we certainly have great assets to leverage in Vermont to support that work. Uh, just in current terms of, I think we have one of the highest rates of uh, children and youth who are insured, um, as well as an incredibly robust uh, school-based mental health system um, that we can continue to build upon. Focusing our promotion and prevention activities, uh, particularly on our youngest from honors, is a key priority of Vision 2030. Uh, this is something that the Department of Mental Health takes very seriously. And so today we will discuss the child and youth system of care, uh, some key initiatives that we're working on, and then to illuminate um, the committee on some of the impacts of COVID that we're seeing and some of the steps that we're taking to mitigate against them. So there are a few key takeaways. You're going to hear a lot of information, a lot of data. Uh, here are some of the key pieces that we really think the committee should be focusing on. Um, number one is continuing to double down on our efforts to fully reopen schools. Uh, we know that public health emergencies can have both short-term and long-term impacts on the mental health and well-being of children and youth. This pivot to hybrid and remote learning has met left many of our Vermont children and youth lacking some of the benefits of access to school, the social interaction, the personal connection, the structure and the routine. And so when we think about healthy development for children and youth, we think about promoting protective factors, which is social connection, concrete supports and building social and emotional competence. Um, one of the most protective factors that we can offer our children and youth um, is access to school. Um, so that is certainly something that we continue to focus on. Um, it is where many of our children and youth access mental health services, um, particularly for those who are most vulnerable. The second area that we also see is absolutely critical. It was critical pre-COVID, it is even more critical now, is our ability to be more proactive and responsive to children and youth and families uh, when they are experiencing a crisis or even to intervene before there's a crisis. Um, mobile response is a critical initiative that the Department of Mental Health is putting forward. Uh, we have a real opportunity um, to provide supports to children, youth, and families 
in their homes in a more proactive way. Mobile response is a way to achieve that. Um, it was put forward as part of our governor's recommended budget. Um, we are proposing a demonstration site in the Rutland area. We'll get provide more data and information in terms of the need. Um, but again, we really need to turn our attention um, to supporting children and youth more proactively to prevent them needing to go to these higher levels of care, such as emergency departments, residential treatment, and inpatient. Uh, the last big key takeaway, which I know this committee um, and the chair is very aware of, is support for workforce recruitment efforts. What is fundamental to having a strong mental health system of care is our workforce. Um, so we are thinking about and looking at uh, creating a task force uh, to really articulate a five-year strategy to strengthen our mental health workforce. It is articulated as a part of Vision 2030. Um, I think we really need to outline what exactly are we going to do to advance and support our mental health uh, providers, create a pipeline and support for new folks coming into the field. So again, that is another area that we are focusing on as a department. And I think at this point, um, I'm going to turn it over to Laurel, um, who is gonna walk us through uh, just an overview of the system of care uh, to make sure that committee members uh, really understand it. Um, and then we'll be diving into some of the data pieces as I noted as well, Laurel. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Laurel Omland. I'm the Director of the Child Adolescent Family Unit at the department, as Sarah said earlier. And we thought it would be important to start with um, some laying foundation about our system here in Vermont. And so a really quick history lesson um, for those who might not be as familiar with it. So this is uh, the early timeline of our child, child and family system of care in Vermont. Um, and I guess just to reflect on this, when I was my daughter, my the age of my daughter, the age that my daughter is now, when I was her age, if I had experienced significant mental health difficulties, the only options for my family would have been outpatient uh, therapy or inpatient therapy with nothing in between and pretty limited at that. So I would anticipate my parents would have felt fairly isolated, uh, struggling to figure out what supports um, I needed as many parents did at that time. Um, and it, it was that that really drove um, the leaders in our state to look at how to expand options for children across Vermont. And so we were um, one of the first states to have the system of care grant um, from the uh, SAMHSA from the federal government to establish a child use and family system of care. Um, we also, I uh, think, have a proud history here in Vermont about our Act 264 um, legislation, which really uh, established um, a commitment in Vermont to coordination of care across the different entities who serve children and families here. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then we've continued that um, uh, work in additional innovative um, partnerships through the Success Round 6 program with schools. Um, again, we'll talk about that to some extent. And then uh, additional expansion of system of care lens around the early childhood world, the um, transition age youth. And now we're continuing to focus on infusing concepts around trauma-informed care and resilience development, as well as integrated care, really trying to assure that we have structures to um, connect mental health services in places where children and families typically are. So in schools, in primary care, in early childhood settings, and um, in communities, especially for our transition age youth. We know that providing quality mental health services in places where they are can have lasting outcomes. And so that is um, one of the goals of our system. But it's important to understand that that system of care really established some of our core values that continue today, the concept of working together, um, the concept of having family voice as paramount in that effort and expanding what service array we have available to meet the needs and the changing needs of kids and families. So a little bit about Act 264, if you're not familiar with it, it is the foundation of our system of care for children and families, not just for mental health, um, but across child welfare, um, juvenile justice, education, and then it expanded under the federal interagency agreement um, to all disabilities. So that includes um, our development disability services entity, um, vocational rehab, et cetera. So what this did was it really established um, some core components for our state that continue to function today. Um, 
As I mentioned, it meant that families are at the table as an equal partner in talking about what their needs are in informing how our system is established and, and develops. Um, there are common values across those entities I mentioned. Um, and then there's a problem solving pathway, which starts at a treatment team or a team level of those who are already working with the child, but can also bring other partners to the table to really help ensure that we're leveraging all the potential resources that are available across our system to meet the needs of that family. Um, and that can happen through the local interagency teams that are in each of our 12 uh, human services districts, as well as a state level interagency team, which has all those partners at the state level um, together. And there's a mandate to provide coordinated services. And we have a, a um, coordinated services plan that um, can be a useful tool as teams work through this with families. I think what's important to understand is that um, while we strive to function as a holistic system and, and really strive to uphold these values, we each uh, it, of our departments and our parts of the system have our own mandates, our own rules and regulations and our, our own resources. And so that's often where some of the challenges um, arise, but it is still a helpful structure that um, guides us uh, to come together to figure out how to best meet the needs of, of children and families across Vermont. So for mental health, um, this is just a quick visual about the division we have here at the department um, for children, child, youth, and family mental health in Vermont. And this is really a public health approach. Um, if we were to start at the bottom to understand this, it's really thinking about how um, our mental health system can promote mental wellness for all children, youth, and family. Um, how do we provide targeted supports to reduce um, risk factors and increase resiliency and protective factors? And then what um, can we offer for in intensive or intervention and treatment services for children, youth, and families who have identified mental health needs? And we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about some of the specifics of um, the, what, what is offered at those different um, layers within that public health triangle. If I could just add real quick, I, I would say that um, DMH sees its purview or its lane, if you will, as the entire spectrum. Certainly we have obligations for people who um, are more severely affected with mental illness, um, but we really want to look at the entire spectrum, especially when it comes to kids and youth. Absolutely. Thank you, David. And I think it's notable that um, many of our resources are focused on that intervention layer. And I think there's been a strong effort to try to ensure that we do have um, resources and um, offerings that, that really address mental health wellness. Um, how do we communicate about what that means for children and families? Um, and I think some of the partnerships that we have with our schools can be um, really important in that avenue. So taking those um, levels and thinking about what are the different aspects in our current system, um, this gives some examples of those. And I think it's, again, noting that our mandated service population are children youth with serious um, emotional disturbance in their families. But again, we really want to um, provide as much promotion, early intervention as possible so that um, to reach that level and we can support them earlier. Um, in that need. So here we have um, some promotion prevention activities Excuse around me. mental health consultation. Yeah. Am um, I the only yes. one hearing um, problems yeah. with your audio? Or audio? <gasps> oh. Thank you, I was muted. Yeah. I was trying to say the same thing, so. Same. <laughs> yeah, the, so uh, Laurel, is there, um, just be aware that your audio is spotty. Okay. It's going in and out, but it, it seems okay now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sorry. Go for it, but apologize maybe for that. Off your video, and that might help a little. Sometimes turning off your video helps. Sure. If I can figure out how to do that when I'm screen sharing, I'm just not as sure how that works. Just go to stop video. You've got your three little dots. You've got video down at the bottom. You can just hit stop video. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that input. And please um, interrupt again if it continues. Is this okay? So okay. You're fine. Go, go ahead. You're fine. Great. 
Okay, so as you can see here, um, we do have uh, promotion prevention activities. This is just a, a short list representative. Um, we offer some child psychiatric consultation within primary care, um, the school mental health role that we um, play with the agency of education around their broader um, school uh, environment activities with the multi-tiered system of supports. Um, so not necessarily targeted to particular individuals, but really looking at that broader population level of need. Um, and then for the earlier intervention or supports for families, um, we do recognize that respite is a really key component of that. We can offer some additional um, supportive counseling, care coordination that can happen in different settings, including school um, and primary care. And then at the intensive level is really thinking about that, that much more intensive level of need where there might be some intensive home and community-based services or even some out-of-home treatment, including crisis supports, um, inpatient, et cetera. So I, I think it's also important to understand how, um, as our system has evolved over the years, the number of children and families that have been served has also been on the increase. And so this is a, a quick representation of that. Um, and this does reflect all children served through the designated and special service agencies in Vermont. Um, the reason for this increase, I, I think we all can understand is multifaceted. There are many contributors, um, some of the social determinants of health that you may be familiar with, um, the opiate uh, and substance use issues that our, our communities have faced, um, exposure to trauma, um, et cetera. So it's also, I think, a, a recognition that people are um, seeking assistance and wanting to help address some of the challenges that they're experiencing. I would also say that Vermont is good at identifying the needs for children and being responsive um, so that those are all contributors um, to this. If, if you were to overlay, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Richard. Oh, go ahead, please. I just was gonna say, if you overlay the level of acuity uh, with this graph, would, what would we see? I, I think we would see an increase in the acuity. Um, and that's something that, especially as we get into talking about the, the school-based services, we have heard as we've traveled around the state um, where numbers of kids might not be that significantly drastic, but the level of need of the children and their families has, has had quite an increase. Um, and so that means that there also is a tremendous need for not just mental health services alone, but really that partnership with our other system partners is essential in trying to address those needs. Um, Dr. Tu, were you going to add something I was just going to make the comment that if this graph isn't dramatic enough, also keep in mind that the absolute number of kids really hasn't changed much and has even dropped, I think, in, in recent years. Thank you. So to zoom in a little bit onto our school mental health in Vermont, um, we've had this structure as, as noted on that kind of timeline since the um, early 90s, where there's a partnership between local schools and our community mental health agencies or our designated mental health agencies, um, and a structure by which the school district can contract with the designated agency and the designated agency can then leverage um, mental health Medicaid to provide the services within the schools. And the um, local match, if you will, or this, the way that Medicaid works is we need to put forward a state match to draw down the federal match. And so that state match essentially comes through the local school district. Um, and then we're able to enhance that with the Medicaid federal um, component of it. And it was started um, in the 90s as an attempt to reduce the cost burden on education um, to meet the needs of Medicaid enrolled students in their schools and address the, the mental health supports with the goal that students can then be available um, to learn in the school building. So um, the past 10 years, I think, again, to speak to what we just noted, the population of students served hasn't changed that much. I think we're all aware that the actual population of students in schools has reduced over the years. And again, as um, we've been talking with um, principals, superintendents, special education directors, as well as our designated agencies, everyone um, speaks to the fact that even though the actual numbers haven't changed, the acuity level um, is more intense. And um, there's, there's just a significant need uh, that we're all trying to meet within uh, for, for students in schools. The way that our 
um, Success Fantastic School Mental Health is structured is essentially in three categories, if you will. Those are listed here. Um, we have school-based clinicians. So these are more master's level, um, often licensed clinicians who can provide clinical services, but also can be partners with schools and thinking about um, at a, a school-wide level, how is the mental health, social emotional needs of students and educators um, being met and can provide some consultation around that. We also have behavioral intervention programs that can provide more intensive um, behavioral supports for students who might struggle to be present um, in their learning. And then we have um, what's called concurrent education, rehabilitation and treatment or CERT as we often call it. And that's really layering this um, Success Beyond Six Medicaid therapeutic service within a therapeutic school, alternative school setting. Um, and so those are a, a small number of programs, but again, an intensive level of supports um, for those students. And I should note that um, for the behavioral intervention program and, and the CERT program, um, these are also serving students who have um, autism spectrum disorder and have those intensive needs as well. Um, I think it would also be helpful to note that about 32% of youth who are served through our designated and special service agencies receive some of those services through this Success Beyond Six School Mental Health component of our programming. It is about a $72 million Medicaid spending authority um, that we have for this, although our actual um, spending has been somewhat under that, especially in this past year um, with uh, COVID and, and the shifts with school. Um, we did for this current fiscal year in the, the contract contractual partnerships between the local schools and the designated agencies, there was about a 27% reduction in FTEs that were contracted for this school year compared to last school year. Um, and I would say the majority of that reduction was within that behavioral intervention programming. And that is um, likely due to more of the remote um, learning that was happening. However, it's important to note that all of these services continued um, when COVID hit and when schools did go to either remote or hybrid so that the, the clinicians, the behavioral intervention um, staff were still providing supports um, to those students even when they were learning from home. Um, it was a reduced amount of supports, particularly for the behavioral intervention folks, um, but it was still an important component of helping those students access um, through their remote, remote platforms to manage some of their um, challenges and to work with the families in understanding now um, how to support that student when they're learning in home. So there's quite a bit of coaching of families um, during that period as well. Um, as far as what this looks like across the state, I will say it, it varies um, and there are regional differences. And that is something that's of um, interest to both uh, us at the Department of Mental Health as well as to the Agency of Education um, to understand what those are and um, where are there areas that we want to strengthen and where is that really due to kind of local decision-making. Um, but essentially our understanding about those regional differences is that it's um, partly due to a school or district's own resources, meaning they might have their own um, folks within on their staff who are addressing some of the mental health needs. And so they're determining what additional needs they might have and whether to partner with their local designated agency. Um, but it also might mean that they are making decisions somewhat based on what um, resource funding resource they have available to help um, to put forward in these contracts to leverage that Medicaid. There's also historical, just what is the relationship between the district and the designated agency and that that can contribute to what some of those um, decisions are locally. And then I think a, a really significant component is the workforce um, that's available. And I think you'll be hearing some uh, throughout this that it has been a challenge to continue to have um, the workforce to fill the level of need um, that's needed. So that can also impact um, what those regional differences look like. Whether it's so, Laurel, I, I, this is this is so so enriching. Um, but our we're going to run up against a, a time crunch in about four minutes. Oh. So, uh, and I know that you have information about what's going on, what has happened during the COVID landscape, the COVID landscape, and um, 
so I'm going to ask that you, ca uh, if you can summarize um, a bit more broadly for us and help us move through. And then uh, at some point we will be coming back to this. Okay, sure. I apologize. I think we had understood we might have had no, a little more no, time. No, don't apologize. Our agenda is so full um, and that's what happens at this time of year. Okay. So um, I think some of this can be referenced. You do have the slides. Um, this is a bit of a picture of what's been happening with school mental health during COVID. And as I noted, it did um, those supports and services did continue. Um, and we continue to hear concerns about um, the level of anxiety, uh, mood challenges, family stress, and the impacts of social, social isolation on students. Um, so I will pass this on to David at this point, and then we might uh, come back. And David, I think you're muted. Sorry. It's gonna turn really quickly to how kids are doing right now. And I know people wanna to get to COVID, but it's good to look a little bit about, you know, how people were doing before COVID. And I think the bottom line here, if you look at some of these statistics is that unfortunately for a lot of our youth, um, their mental health really hasn't been good even prior to the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, the trends here in Vermont uh, are similar to trends that we are seeing nationally. Uh, if you look at some of these statistics, you know, I find in particular the idea that six, six and a half percentage of our youth uh, say that they actually had a suicide attempt in the last year is, is, is quite troubling. And um, this is all really important because I think the research pretty convincingly uh, states that one of the strongest predictors of how well people do um, after a major stressor is how well they were doing before a major stressor. And these statistics would indicate that uh, we have a lot of kids at risk. And in the interest of time, maybe I will move to the next, uh, the next slide and, and Commissioner Squirrel. Yeah, I could walk us through these quickly. Um, this is really getting at kind of current state as David, Dr. Ratu noted, even before the pandemic, we were seeing concerning trends um, in the mental health needs of children and youth. Uh, there was a study that was conducted by um, the University of Vermont and BDH for youth ages 12 to 17, um, kind of comparing uh, where they were in terms of the fall of 2020 versus 2019. And you can see from this slide, um, significantly more depressive symptoms have been reported, um, increases in anxiety, and around 70% of the youth reported that the pandemic made their anxiety, worry, mood, loneliness, a little or a lot worse. Um, and you know, we recognize that um, this was the compounding you know, impact of isolation um, due to COVID-19. Um, and then for young people in particular, this is a time where social connection is so critical to their development. They should naturally be connecting and orienting more towards their peers. But I guess I wanna underscore for the committee that this is a, a, an age group that we are very worried about. Um, the next data slide is really just looking at um, some of our child and adolescent needs and strengths assessment data in terms of children and youth who are identified as lacking community connection, optimism, um, needs related to anxiety. The final bullet here is the rate of ED visits for mental health related concerns has increased. I can tell you today, um, last week, we had 16 children and youth waiting in our emergency departments and you compare that to about four last year. Um, so we are seeing just increases in acuity, increases in need um, that we need to pay attention to. The next slide really gets at what our pediatricians and community partners are telling us. Um, primary care pediatricians have extreme wait lists. Um, 75 to 80% of what they see are referrals for mental health. Um, and just underscoring that the children and youth are not okay. And again, you see this age group of 12 to 17 uh, really emerging as a priority area. And just also recognizing that we know there's diminished capacity in caregivers. Everyone's been in such a tremendous state of stress and we know how that impacts children and youth as well. And then finally, um, I guess this really underscores why 
access to school really matters. Um, school is where we see children and youth. It's where we can as accept, assess, assess what's happening, provide treatment. Um, this data was even startling to me in calendar year 2020, almost 50% of children and youth who are on Medicaid uh, received their mental health services in a school setting, meaning that this is a place where children and youth really access the services and supports that they need. Um, the last bullet on here is just, again, a data point from the Department for Children and Families um, has seen a 21% decrease in calls to their centralized intake and emergency services, um, thus indicating that some children and youth may be suffering in silence because we know that schools are where we see children and youth and can assess that need and risk. And I think finally, we can kind of, you know, these are all trends and data related to just overall increases in pediatric ED visits. You can look at this data a little bit more, you know, at your leisure. And this is really the data that is driving um, our putting forward mobile response. Um, mobile response is an opportunity for us to respond more proactively at the community member level for children and youth and their families who might be experiencing a crisis or ideally before they're experiencing a crisis. Um, it is an evidence-based approach. Other states have implemented mobile response and seen significant reductions in use of higher levels of care, such as residential ED utilization. Um, we are targeting and proposing to um, do a demonstration pilot of mobile response in Rutland. That is a very data-driven decision. You can see here that when we look at ED visits among high utilizing children and youth, you can see that Rutland um, has one of the highest rates of ED utilization. Uh, this is something that is very supported by Rutland Mental Health, um, as well as their local hospital system. We have an opportunity to implement mobile response now to really test and dem demonstrate its efficacy um, in Vermont, and then to look to scale it up statewide. The other opportunity we have with mobile response is that we are currently looking at um, a potential enhanced enhanced FMAP um, for mobile services. Um, so as we look to implement this over the next few years, we'll have a real opportunity to leverage that enhanced FMAP. So again, just underscoring for the committee how urgent and important this particular priority area is. Um, and I think we can probably leave it at that. There's more information on mobile response, you know, how the system is, you know, really an ecosystem in terms of points of care. Um, but I know in the interest of time, um, we should probably wrap up. Yes, thank you. That that that's terrific. I think this is this gets us the information that we need as we're talking about um, any recommendations, either to appropriations or for uh, policy recommendations here. So I'm going to ask, um, that would be great. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. You uh, always bring in comprehensive and detailed information and we can use it. Not, not to worry, we will use it. I'm gonna to turn to uh, Danielle Lindley who is here uh, from the North, uh, Northwest Counseling and Support Center, um, Services Center. So Danielle, thank you for being here. No problem. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the current gaps in the children's system of care. I um, mean, it's really interesting because when you think of Vermont's children and families um, who are experiencing long wait times in the emergency department or waiting on inpatient mental health care, it would be natural to conclude that you would think one of these gaps is our hospitals or residential beds. And it's actually because we have a lack of capacity in our community-based system. Um, I can just give an example for here at NCSS. Many people assume that a lot of the services we provide are outpatient and psychiatry, but actually 93% of our services are delivered in the home and the community. I oversee about 300 staff here at NCSS in the Children's Division, and 20 of those are actually only office-based. So most of our services are provided in the home and the community or we're embedded in the school and pediatric settings or other stakeholders. So I think it's really important for people to know that that is a system that we really, really rely on. Um, when we have these services and we, do, or we don't have these services, it impacts our ability to provide wraparound services to youth in the community. 
So a little information on what is impacting this is really around, um, and you've heard this earlier, is workforce retention and recruit, recruitment challenges. Um, we just don't have the capacity and the workforce to be able to provide the level of um, need that our families are experiencing. COVID definitely has impacted this. Um, children that weren't on our radar, radar before are definitely on our radar. We're seeing an increase in referrals. And with our workforce challenges, currently most of our staff right now are holding caseloads anywhere between um, 15, somewhere is up to 30, which is not typical um, and not, not setting us in a place where we're able to provide the quality of care that we want to. The other thing that is important to note that when we have these vacancies, a typical FT is able to hold um, between 12 and 20 cases. So those are 12 to 20 children and family that are not receiving services that we're then having to triage on our already strained system of care. Another impact of this is really around our, another contributing factor to this is the disparities in pay between mental health clinicians in the community and compared to healthcare schools and state government. Um, we often lose our workforce to those um, other providers. Uh, and another piece around that is that part of our system of care is just not what the DA is providing, but we're seeing also, um, we're having the inability to recruit for foster families, home providers, respite providers, um, uh, mentoring programs. And so those are all things that are really integral to keeping uh, children in their local communities. We also have a lack of community supports for mobile crisis intervention and stabilization. Um, Sarah was speaking, to, our Commissioner Squirrel was speaking about that earlier. And so that's something that's really vital to keeping kids in their community. Also, because of the nature of the acuity and so many people needing services right now, we really have the inability to focus upstream, upstream and invest in some of our prevention to prevent families from being able to access or need to access uh, long-term supports. We'd rather get them earlier in the door so we can identify what the need is and hopefully be able to discharge at a sooner point. And we just at this point are having a real inability to do that. Um, so who are some of the youth that are being impacted by this? Um, these are typically children that are in DCF care. We have a number of kids um, that we're really struggling to be able to keep in our community. We've seen some of our rates within the, across the state of kids that are in care increase. Um, and we just need to be able to provide the services to keep them. We have a high number of kids that are um, diagnosed with sexually reactive behaviors. This requires a very specialized care. Um, and we wanna keep these kids in our community. So we need to be able to have the staff to be able to do that. Um, we're also seeing a trend with kids that have co-occurring kind of developmental disability challenges and mental health. And our system is just not equipped right now there was an influx of children that have been diagnosed with autism. And as they're growing and transitioning, our system does not have the um, level of support that is needed to keep those kids. And so I think the nice thing is that at a state and a local level, we're coming together to look at that and, you know, talking about developing programming and work groups to look at this, but it is definitely a need um, in communities across the state. And we just continue to see kids with significant trauma histories and attachment disorders. So take all of that and then couple it with COVID and it's just kind of a, um, it's kind of a recipe for disaster and we're just really struggling to meet the need at this point. So I know that we're um, short on time, so I don't wanna lecture too much or speak too much. Danielle, we, we, this is a great uh, portrait of what's happening in your life and in the world of the kids around you and families. Uh, and so we really appreciate it. Uh, if you have um, written testimony would, that would be helpful to okay. send that in to us uh, because we do have a we have a couple folks waiting to testify on our on a, the next bills but I I know that Senator Hardy has a question for Commissioner Squirrel and Commissioner Squirrel when Senator Hardy asks that question perhaps you can let us know what your timing is on S, uh, H46 and H104, and if Morning Fox is able to stand in on your testimony for those two. Yes, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox will be covering both of those pieces. I do have to hop off in four minutes just to call into the governor's press conference. So Senator Hardy has a question. Great, okay. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. 
my question actually is, is pretty relevant to probably what you'll be discussing in the governor's press conference. And I, I um, am the mother of three teenagers, so I am living right now with the you know stress of mental health issues and school issues. Um, and I'm really concerned about us reopening schools when we have not prioritized uh, vaccinations for youngest um, people who are eligible. Um, uh, students over 16 are not yet eligible and won't be till Monday. So most of them will not have been able to get vaccinations by the time um, schools are going to be reopening for all students in the high school and middle school age. And I know that under 16, they can't get vaccinated, but I don't understand why our state did not prioritize getting students who could be vaccinated, vaccinated so that um, uh, they were, had the opportunity before um, high schools were reopened fully. Um, I'm really concerned about schools being able to um, maintain protocols. And there's a lot of anxiety and stress about going back to school under the circumstances with rates um, of infection, the highest right now among youngest Vermonters. And so I don't, I know that's not necessarily in your purview, but if you could, I don't understand at all why we didn't prioritize vaccinating students if we are gonna reopen schools. Yeah, it's a great question, Senator Harding. Thank you. Um, and I certainly appreciate um, the anxiety that the school reopening does bring on all fronts. I think that's very real for many families, for teachers and for our incredible education workforce. Um, I think in terms of how the state deployed um, the vaccine program, it really did utilize the age banding um, to ensure that those who were at most risk of death by COVID, um, that they were prioritized. Um, certainly for children and youth, um, the data and scientific research does indicate um, that those health impacts are less. Um, and I think that was the rationale and logic in terms of let's utilize and implement the age banding, not to say that it isn't a priority as well um, to ensure that our youngest Vermonters who are eligible can. And I think that's why you saw the administration really pivot to, you know, unfortunately, once the J&J &J became available, but then unavailable, um, that pairing that vaccination deployment um, with a gradual school reopening was exactly what they were trying and we were trying to accomplish. Um, so that was- I understand. I've talked to, to Commissioner Levine extensively about the age banding. And I, I think to a point it was useful and then it became very um, problematic. And I just think that trying to reopen schools right now without having this age group uh, vaccinated is really challenging. and is adding to the mental health and stress and anxiety levels that we're trying to prevent by reopening schools. And I, I just want you to know that message and hope you can pass it along to others um, because the students will not be vaccinated and would not have been vaccinated without, even if the J&J &J was still online because of the late um, timeline um, for providing the vaccinations for this age group and trying to reopen schools. I think it's very problematic and I appreciate all the efforts to try to reopen schools. I absolutely do. And I know that it's crucial that we do so, but we need to do it safely. And I'm not confident that we are if, we're, if we haven't prioritized vaccinations at this point. Okay, okay well, Senator I, Hardy, I thank you. Uh, so, Commissioner Squirrel, you know, do your follow-up and, but then this is taking us away from the topic at hand, but obviously a topic related to um, stress and anxiety induced as a result of a possible disease. So. Yeah, thank you, Senator Hardy, for your, your questions and concerns. I participate in the governor's um, task force on school reopening, so I will make sure that um, your thinking um, is provided to that group, so thank you. Okay. Um, Danielle, thank you so much as well for being here. And I'm, I don't know if you're hearing from kids about uh, any concerns about heading back to school at this point. For sure. I think um, across the board for a variety of reasons, I think there's a lot of students who aren't even 
engaged in school. So the thought of stepping back into school is just so complicated and so anxiety provoking for a number of reasons. I know that, you know, I, I, I have two younger children and I think just for knowing what the virus is, they're still scared that they're going to get the virus and how long is this going to happen? And when is when will things be back to normal? So I, I actually don't know of too many kids where um, the thought of being in school full time isn't anxiety provoking or are provoking some sort of emotional reaction. Um, I think schools, I will say I am impressed with schools and how they're coming together with the recovery teams. And so I'm very appreciative of that. I think uh, a lot of community partners are coming and partnering with them so that we can be proactive and try to provide a lot of service to make this transition a little bit smoother and less anxiety provoking, but it will take some time for sure. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for being here today. And Dr. Ratu, thank you for uh, being available to us. And I think at this point, we're going to move on to the bills. And, and Laurel, I'm not ignoring you. I just couldn't see you. So uh, thank you, Laurel, for also for being here. Your, your testimony is always spot on and really very much appreciated. Uh, and we will get back to this issue um, uh, pretty quickly going forward. So thank you.